Hi. I started trying to record chapters seven and eight last night. But I was so tired, and the recording program just wouldn't work. So here we are. So chapter seven of Buddy. We can't let Buddy out of the shed that first day because everything is too wet. But come Saturday, I open that door in the morning and I say, "Today is your day, Buddy. Today you get to come outside." He pokes his nose out the door and his ears go whoop, standing straight up on top of his head. He looks round at the tree, waving its leaves at the top of the fence where the cat's claw vine is busting out with yellow flowers, and he starts barking up a storm, standing there with his nose pointing at the tree like he's trying to show me something. That's just squirrels, I say. Ain't nothing new. He looks at me like he wants to make sure I know what I'm talking about. Then he starts exploring. He's got his own way of walking. His one back foot has to do double time to keep up with his two front feet. He's slow and wobbly, but he gets where he's going. First, he hobbles over to where the fence meets up with the shed, and he starts sniffing at the ground, poking his nose at every stick that fell out of the trees. Cruising across the half-dead grass to check out the pecan, pecan tree. Now in the south we say pecan. I say pecan. I'm from Texas. What do I know, right? Anyway, the pecan tree, pushing a rotten old pecan along the ground. Then he snugs up next to the tree, walks in a circle twice. And lays himself down in a spot of dirt between two roots sticking up out of the ground. Is that your place, buddy? I say, and he looks me in the eye and goes rough. And I guess that means yes, it is. And don't bother me when I'm laying here. About that time, Daddy bangs open the back door and leans halfway out. It's Saturday, he yells. I know that. You know what it means? I can't help it. I roll my eyes. Don't you roll your eyes at me? I ain't rolling my eyes, and I know I'm supposed to mow the yard, but there ain't hardly any grass. There's enough, and the front yard needs it bad. Ever since we moved into Grandpa T's house, cutting the grass has been my job. Grandpa T says that's half the reason he asked us to move in. He says after almost forty years of going around and around the same yard, he's tired of cutting that grass. He figures he's got a grandson who can do it, so it's time to turn over the reins. That first summer, he showed me how to gas up the lawnmower and run it back and forth so I don't miss any spots. At first, I couldn't pull the cord, and Grandpa T did it for me. But I finally got the knack, and I don't need anybody's help anymore. I don't get anybody's help either. It's all on me. So I go over to the shed and roll out the lawnmower. Buddy perks up when he sees me. I'm guessing he probably didn't know that smelly old thing sitting in his house could move. While I'm gassing it up, he limps over and stands right smack up next to me, his mouth hanging open and his eyes watching what I'm doing with the gas can. <clears throat> he jerks his head back when he gets a little whiff of the fumes, and then leans down to check out the wheels and sniff the dead grass still stuck on the sides. What's so interesting about this old lawnmower, buddy? I say. And he looks up at me with his tongue hanging out and his tail wagging. When I start this thing up, it's going to blow your ears out and scare you to death. His tail just keeps on wagging. His mouth looks like he's grinning, and his eyes look like they've got little sparkles dancing around in them. 
Go on, back to your place by the tree. Ruff. I mean it, buddy, go on. And I fling out my hand, and he starts to jump like he thinks I'm throwing something, and whomp, he falls over. Buddy, I'm squatting down, trying to help him up, but before I get all the way down, he's standing up again, panting at me like he's waiting for me to do something. What do you want, buddy? I say. He takes a step away from me, and then he takes a step back toward me. He never stops looking at me, his eyes all bright and shiny, his mouth open, and his ears perked up. He wants you to throw a ball. I look up, and there's Grandpa T at the back door. How do you know that? I use my eyes. I ain't got a ball. Baby Terrell does. Hold on a minute. Grandpa T heads in the house, and I look down at Buddy. What do you know? about chasing a ball. Catch, Grandpa T says, and I look up. Before I can figure out what he's doing, Grandpa T's already thrown the ball toward the back fence, and Buddy's hobbling to it the best he can. Buddy pokes around in the brush against the fence, and sure enough, he finds the ball and brings it back to me. Well, I'll be, I say, and take it from him. Somebody's taught him to play catch, Grandpa T says. He ain't a stray. He used to be somebody's pet. I look up. The back door slams, and Grandpa T is gone. It don't take me long to mow the yard. In the front, there are just little squares on either side of the sidewalk because Mama's got bushes and flowers up next to the house and along the fence. And the grass ain't hardly growing yet with the oak tree next door putting so much shade out on the yard. In the back, I get it all cut in about two passes while Buddy's standing just inside the shed barking. When I get the lawnmower all parked again, I pick up the ball and throw it. Sure enough, Buddy goes after it and brings it back. I throw it again. He brings it back. It's wet with slobber. His sides are heaving when he tries to draw breath. I lift up my hand to throw the ball again, but he heads on over to the pecan tree and sits down. I sit down beside him, and we listen to the sounds all around us. The squirrels are chucking in the bushes, and the birds are chirp, chirping their warnings to each other. There are kids playing in the next block. There are air conditioners running. There are cars and trucks in the street. The tree frogs are singing in the trees, and people are talking when they walk by. There are sirens that beep, beep. Oh, there are sirens, and that beep, beep sound when the truck... Let's try that sentence one more time. There are sirens and that beep, beep sound when working trucks back up. Buddy lays his head on my leg and I start rubbing him. I touch that old caterpillar scar and he closes his eyes. Where'd you get that, buddy? I say and his tail goes flip just once. Did you run away, I say? Were they mean to you? The end of his tail flicks a little dust in, a little in the dust. Or did they just leave you in the street one day? I rub my hand all the way down to Buddy's cut off leg. He don't even twitch. I've heard about people doing that. What kind of people would just leave their dog like that? Somebody walking down the street is yelling into his cell phone. Buddy looks up for a second and then puts his head back down. They didn't love you like I love you, buddy. All of a sudden, a squirrel goes galloping along the top of the fence. Buddy's up and barking before I can move. He's stepping all over me and his claws are scratching my legs and then, wham, down he goes right in my lap. By the time he gets himself straightened up, that squirrel is all the way at the top of the pecan tree. Buddy's panting in my face and looking up in the tree like he's wondering... What I'm planning to do about that squirrel. And I'm laughing myself silly. You crazy old dog, I say, and I hug him up around the neck. Can't nobody ever love you like I love you. Ruff, Buddy says. Ruff, ruff. 
And I swear, that dog smiles. And that's the end of chapter 7. So if you're of a mind to, you can pause right here. Or we can go on, keep going. Chapter 8. Sunday morning when we get back from church, Buddy's barking up a storm again in the backyard. What the blue blazes is wrong with that dog, Grandpa T says. I'm hopping out of the car and running to the back without even unbuttoning my collar. And there's Buddy, standing there under the tree and barking at something on the roof of the shed. When he draws a breath, I can hear a squirrel chucking away, telling all his squirrel friends to get out of the way because there's some kind of crazy dog living under the pecan tree now. Buddy, I'm yelling, Buddy, be quiet. It is just a squirrel. But Buddy keeps on barking, and that squirrel keeps on chucking. Have you lost your mind, I say. What's the matter with... And then I see it. Laying on the ground between Buddy's two front feet is a teeny tiny baby bird. It's so tiny it don't have any feathers at all. It's just a ball of gray. Grandpa T, come see, it's a bird. And here comes Grandpa T, hustling around the corner of the house, cussing Buddy and complaining about the heat. All of a sudden, Buddy stops barking. There ain't no chucking either. Better get it quick before it eats it, Grandpa says. Buddy ain't going to quit, Grandpa T says, and I look and Buddy's bending down looking at that bird. I can't hardly move. Buddy touches it with his nose and I step forward. Don't eat that bird, Buddy, I say. He looks up panting and grinning at me. What do you want with that baby bird? Buddy's ears are all perked up and his tail is wagging. I hold out my hand and Buddy says, Ruff! Then he backs up his, his wobbledy way and stands watching me and Grandpa T. I bend down and pick up the little bitty bird. He's so scared he don't move an eye. Buddy's tail is going a mile a minute. I turn around to Grandpa T. He ain't going to eat no bird, I say. He's saving it from the squirrels. Dogs don't do that, Grandpa T says. But he did, I say. Grandpa T ain't got no answer to that. Tanya says she wants to keep that bird for her pet since I've got Buddy. But Grandpa T says it's too little to leave its mama, and we've got to try to put it back. So we spend the rest of the afternoon trying to get that bird back in his nest. But he can't take his eyes off us with the ladder propped up against the trunk and me dangling off a limb halfway up the tree. He's stumbling around under the tree, whining and yipping with so much we finally shut him up in the shed. He keeps on whining, but at least nobody's going to trip over him. We look and look and can't find that bird's nest. In the end, we make a new nest with an old basket from out of the shed. Tanya stuffs it full of dry grass and cries when we stick it in some branches where the mama can find it. But the squirrels are come back, she says. Can't do nothing about the squirrels, Daddy says. If you got a pecan tree in the backyard, you got to have squirrels. Little T let that dog out of the shed before he drives us all crazy. We're sitting down to eat dinner when Buddy starts up again. We all rush out the back door and there's Buddy barking at the squirrels. He ain't giving them no polite rough rough neither. He sounds like if they get close enough to him, he's going to rip their throats out. They're chucking and chucking and he's barking and barking. We sit back down and Buddy keeps on barking. He's keeping those squirrels off that bird, Grandpa T says. <laughs> Daddy says, dogs don't do that. Grandpa T looks over at me and we smile. And that's the end of chapter 8. That was a really short chapter. <clears throat> let's see. Yeah, let's go on to chapter 9. Next morning, Buddy starts up again. 
Mom says it's going to drive her up a wall. Daddy says the neighbors are going to start complaining. Grandpa T says he's going to have to shoot either the squirrels or the dog if he's ever going to take a nap again. Tanya looks like she's going to start crying, and Grandpa T says he's just teasing. And can't she tell when he's teasing and when he ain't? In the end, Mama don't climb the wall, the neighbors don't complain, and Grandpa T's gun stays put. By the time school lets out for the summer, Buddy's got all the squirrels scared off, and I feel like I'm finally out of prison. No more bus to ride. No more teachers going on and on. No more homework. Mama says for the first week, I'm on vacation. But after that, she's not making any promises. That first morning, I wake up when I please. Take care, Bunny, and wander on back into the house where it's cool. After a while, I flip on the TV, and there's Scooby-Doo driving a car or something, and I think, I wonder what Buddy would say to that. Tanya's sitting there with me. When the commercials come on, she says she wants a doll and a wedding dress for Christmas. Mama says, don't start talking to her about Christmas, and when are we going to get up and make our beds, and don't we have anything to do but watch cartoons? I look outside, and there's Buddy, laying in his cool place in the shade, keeping an eye on the yard. I go and sit with him. You think it, you think it's this hot in Chicago? I ask him. I hold the ball in my hand and toss it up and down, but Buddy don't hardly look at it. Do you suppose school's out up there too? I put the ball down in front of his nose and he pokes it once or twice, but he's too lazy to move more than that. Do you think they swim in that big old lake in the summertime? He swishes his tail around in the dust, but he don't move anything else. What do you think of Jamila ain't? Why do you think Jamila ain't never answered my letter? But he looks at me with his caterpillar eyebrow raised up like he wishes he knew. I'm going to write her again, I say. But he flips his tail to say he thinks that's a good idea. I'm going to tell her how good you're doing. Buddy lays his head down and closes his eyes. I guess he's had enough of talking. I just sit there watching him and let my hand smooth the top of his head over and over. I'm thinking it will be an easy letter to write because there ain't no doubt about it. Buddy's doing better. He's getting around good when he stays inside the yard. His ribs ain't showing near as bad. His bandage is off, and if you look at him right, you forget there are only three legs. But all that getting well is hungry work. But he's eating more and more, and my Game Boy money is almost gone. Something's got to happen, but I don't know what. I don't have anything else to sell, and I ain't old enough to get a job. I need another plan. What am I going to do, buddy? I say, but he don't say nothing. He's so asleep his tail don't even twitch. I lean back against the bark of the tree. I look up. Somewhere behind the leaves is the big old sky. You got any answers? You got any ideas? But the sky don't answer back. I ask Grandpa T if he'll pay me to mow the lawn, and he looks at me and says, <laughs> That ain't even funny. Go on, boy, and find yourself something to do. I ask Mama if she'll pay me to bag up pralines. She says, I've lost my mind, and leave her alone while she's cooking. I know better than to say anything to Daddy. That's just asking for trouble. I sit down by baby Terrell. I lean up close and say, Kuchy kuchy goo. And he whops me with his toy truck. Tanya yells out to Mama that I'm bothering the baby and then says, Don't step on her toes. 
Mama leans in the door and says, Go throw the ball with that dog, and I say, It's too hot. Mama says, Well, do something, and I ask, What? She says, You better think of something before I think of something for you. And then Tanya pipes up and says, She wants a snowball. Before you know it, Mama reaches in her purse and pulls out some money and tells me to take Tanya down the street and get her a snowball. Get one for yourself, too, she says. So, out the door we go. That sun's beating down on us all the way down the street. Tanya's about to step in an ant hill, so I push her to one side and she knocks up against somebody's fence and turns around and says, I'm telling... And I say, you want fire ants crawling all over your feet? And she sticks out her tongue at me. I ain't never taking you for a snowball again, I say. Meanie, she says, and sashays on down the sidewalk like she thinks she's grown. The lady at the snowball stand has sweat running down her face. Tanya's standing there with her finger in her mouth trying to decide what flavor she wants. I can't hardly stand up. It's so hot. Just say bubble gum, I say. You always want bubble gum. Now I want something different, she says, and keeps on standing there. Maybe green, she says. Mint, the lady says, and mops the counter. Tanya makes her face. Pink, she says. Strawberry or cherry, the lady says. Tanya's finger goes back in her mouth, and I roll my eyes. You're holding up the line, I say to Tanya. Tanya looks around. That ain't no line. I'm the line, I say, and I'm waiting. Tanya heaves a sigh. Bubble gum, she says. I'll have bubble gum. What about you, son, the lady says. I've got my mind all made up. I open my mouth to say strawberry, and then I shut it. All of a sudden, I'm thinking, I don't have to buy a snowball. I can save that money. Mama won't ever know. Nothing for me, I say. Tanya spins around. Well, why are you fussing about me if you ain't getting nothing yourself? That lady's waiting, I say. You're taking up her time. I pay for Tanya and put the same amount in my pocket. All the way home, I'm trying to make a plan. How many times do we have to get snowballs before I can buy another bag of food? What if Tanya tells Mama I didn't get one? Wonder if anybody else wants somebody to take their little kid to get a snowball. I'm trying to do all the numbers in my head. They ain't working out like I want. I'm thinking I need a piece of paper if I'm going to figure all this out. When we get home, I forget all about the paper. Buddy takes a good, long look at Tanya and decides he better clean her up. He starts licking her face. He's licking her hands. He's licking her legs. He's sniffing her sandal shoes and poking his nose at the leftover paper from the snowball. Tanya's laughing like she's having the time of her life, and Buddy starts up barking. You crazy dog, Tanya says, laughing so hard she's about to fall over. I ain't a squirrel. Finally, I tell Tanya to get inside and clean herself up, because she's the worst mess I've ever seen in my life. I throw the ball for Buddy, and he goes to find it. Four times in a row. It's a record. Then he goes over to his bowl and slurps out some water. He looks up at me with his face all wet and drippy. You bad as Tanya, I say, and he wags his tail. You ain't got a lick of sense, I say, and he wags the tail harder. You ain't even worried about how I'm going to feed you, are you? Buddy says, Ruff! And I know that means, You'll figure it out, little T. I know I can count on you. And that's the end of chapter 9. Shall I do one more? Sure, why not?
Chapter 10 Saturday morning, Daddy shakes me awake bright and early. You forgot to do your job. What job? You're supposed to cut the grass. You ain't run the mower, lawn mower in over a week. I can't help it. I make a face. Just for that, Daddy says, you can cut Mrs. Washington's grass, too. But her nephew gone, she ain't got nobody to do it, and you ain't got nothing else to do. I look up at Daddy, and he's standing there with his arms crossed over his chest. I pull the pillow over my face. Why do I have to do Miss Washington's, too? Why can't somebody else... Just for that, you can do it this week and next, Daddy says. You better quit while you ahead, boy, and get out of that bed. There ain't nothing for it. I have to do it. When the grass starts growing in the spring, it ain't so bad. Everything's all fresh and green, and the air is even a little cool. And you don't have to mow, but maybe once every two weeks. But by the time the summer comes, the air feels like a wet rag laying across your face, and the mosquitoes are biting all day. You have to do it at least once a week, and even then there's so much cut-off grass laying there, you have to rake it up and spread it under the bushes. Grandpa T keeps saying he's going to get one of those mowers with a bag on the back. But there ain't never enough money for that. So I just keep on raking. When I make it out to the shed, Buddy's standing there waiting for me like he knew I was coming. What do you want, Buddy, I say. He says, Ruff. I drag the mower out of the shed and gas it up. I yank on the cord, and when it starts up, Buddy yelps, and it hops back into the shed. You stay right there, I yell. I ain't going to be long. I whip that mower around the yard so fast, baby Terrell ain't even finished with his bottle by the time I'm done. Buddy comes creeping out of the shed, and when I start rake, when I start raking up the grass. This is a fool thing to do, ain't it, Buddy? He's poking his nose in my pile of grass. Why can't people, why people can't let their grass just grow, I don't know. I rake that grass up under the bushes, slinging a rake over my shoulders, and shove the lawnmower through the gate. But he's standing there on his three legs, panting in the heat, and wondering what he's supposed to do. You stay there, buddy, I say. I'll be back. He sits right down, and he waits. Miss Washington lives two streets up and around the corner. It ain't that far to walk, but it's a far, but it's far to push the mower. I'm already hot by the time I get there, and I just get hotter walking around and around in the sun. She ain't got a single tree in her yard. Mama says she won't let any grow there because she's afraid they'll fall over in a storm and crush her house. I think old people get crazier every year. When I'm about done, I'm about to push through the gate when she opens the door and walks out on the porch. I got a cold drink inside, she says. You want one? I know Buddy's waiting, but I don't ever turn down a cold drink. I roll the lawnmower around to the backyard so nobody will steal it, and she opens the kitchen door and lets me into the cool. Her house is tiny. Her kitchen is just about big enough for two people to stand in. She opens her refrigerator and I step into the hallway. What kind you want, she says behind the door. Have you got a Coke? I do, she says. Here it is. The door shuts and she stands up and hands me a cold drink. It ain't a Coke. That's the last one, she says. I don't know what to do. I pop open the top and take a sip. It's good. But it ain't a Coke. Sit down, she says, and points to the front room sofa. I sit down. I've got a letter, she says, and pulls a letter out from under the lamp sitting on the s table by the sofa. From my rack, she says. You want to read it? 
What am I supposed to say? She hands it to me. Open it, she says. Read it out loud. Dear Aunt Mary, it starts out. I look up at her. She's looking at me through her big thick glasses. All of a sudden, it dawns on me. She can't hardly see. She can't see it ain't a Coke. She can't see to read her letter. I put down the cold drink and start to read all the things her nephew has to say. How he misses that and how he misses that. How he misses this and how he misses that. How the other brothers are good and they're a team. How he's worried about her all alone. How he can't wait to get home. How he's got plans to fix up the kitchen. How he's got to go now, but he'll write again soon. I finish it up and look over at her and she's smiling. He's a good boy, she says and stands up. She reaches in her purse and hands me a five dollar bill. You didn't think you were mowing for free, did you? She laughs. You come back next week. You can read his next letter. When I get home, Buddy's waiting for me at the gate. I push the lawnmower toward the shed and he's sniffing at the wheels. I roll the lawnmower into its spot and I sit down by Buddy blanket. Buddy's blanket. He limps over and lays down with his head in my lap. I run my hand across his head. I brush the bristly ends of his caterpillar eyebrow. I pull on his ears and I scratch up under his neck. He turns his head and looks up at me. Miss Washington's nephew's doing all right, I say. He sounds happy enough. But he shifts his head a little. Maybe I'll join the army, I say, but I don't want to go to Iraq. I rub behind Buddy's ears. Miss Washington's a nice lady, I say. She gave me five dollars. I look over at Buddy's food bag. All of a sudden, I have an idea. And one more time, I'm making a plan. And that's the end of chapter ten. And I think that's about all we're going to do today. We've done four chapters today. That's pretty good. Now, <clears throat> I have to get into my normal speaking voice. Wow. We're all the way up to chapter 11. That's really good, you guys. So, remember, if you want us to talk to me... Or if you want to write to me, or if you just want to like and subscribe and share, that would be great. Until next time, may the Lord bless and keep you. May He make His face shine on you. And be gracious to you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you. And give you peace. And give you peace. Have a great time. And I'll talk to you next time. Bye.